have a few stragglers that come into the presentation later today, but again, thanks everyone for joining us today for this Launch and Learn on Winchester Dam. Um, this will be our third Launch and Learn. It's a series that we've kind of started with Native Fish Society that we look to continue throughout this year, um, and especially during these times of, of COVID-19. So it's kind of exciting to uh, share with the community this opportunity of what work we have going on and um, some of the issues that we have with uh, our rivers and our fish and the communities across Oregon. So thank you everyone. For the Zoom presentation today, I just wanna outline some of the things that, um, that we have going on and expectations with Zoom. Um, we will be recording this presentation. So I just want everyone to be aware of that. Um, we're gonna record it and also share it on our, our website afterwards. If you're not talking or engaged in conversation, would you please mute yourself? We do have the opportunity to mute you if, um, if necessary. If, if we do mute you, you'll have to take yourself off of mute um, in order to talk. Um, at the end of the presentation, there's gonna be an opportunity to ask Jim and myself some questions. Um, if you would please um, you know, use courtesy yeah. and speak when, when available. Um, if we have multiple questions coming at once, I'm going to ask folks to raise their hands. Um, at that point, we're going to facilitate folks and call on people to go ahead and unmute themselves and ask questions. There's an also a chat box if anyone's unfamiliar with it. It's at the bottom of the Zoom screen. You can type your, your questions into the chat box and I'll ask Jim those questions afterwards. We did have a, multiple questions sent in to us. Yeah. Um, through the registration. So I'm, I'm gonna make it hopefully to all, all the questions today, um, but we'll, we'll get to those at the end of the, um, the presentation. So with that, I'm gonna go ahead and um, introduce our guest speaker, Jim McCarthy. Um, Jim's the Southern Oregon Regional, um, Southern Oregon Program Director for right. Water Watch of Oregon. Um, he's been amazing. and. I just want to give a huge shout out to Jim. He has uh, led the efforts and information on Winchester Dam for years now. Um, and he's really kind of been the North Star for all of our, our folks working to um, bring these concerns up with the dam. So I want to thank Jim for his efforts. And um, with that, I'm going to go ahead and hand it over to him. Uh, thanks, Kirk. Um, really appreciate that introduction and, and uh, appreciate Native Fish having me here today to talk about Winchester Dam and, and everything that's going on. And thanks everyone for, for your time. Um, as many folks know, there is a um, 22 member um, local and statewide coalition of fishing, conservation and whitewater groups working to end the harm caused by Winchester Dam on the North Umpqua. Um, there are a number of um, legal and regulatory processes that have uh, resulted uh, from that um, coalition uh, working together uh, over um, years uh, to, um, to raise these issues and to push them forward. Um, Native Fish Society, Steamboaters, TNF, uh, Umpqua Watersheds, uh, um, a lot of groups have been uh, working uh, very hard um, for, uh, for years on this. Uh, just recently, it's gotten into the news, but it's something that, that actually has been uh, something that folks have worked on for years. And even before our coalition, Winchester was the subject of, of a lot of regulatory attention, uh, a lot of legal attention um, related to, um, to its impact on fisheries. Primarily, and um, and and the harm uh, it has caused and is is causing. So I do have a PowerPoint. Um, is that something I can share, Kirk? Um, Correct. If you click share screen at the bottom, you should be. Um... Okay, I'll share my screen and then hit my PowerPoint here, and let's see if I can. If I'm competent enough to do this, can you guys see the first slide? I'm supposed to dam them. Yes. Okay, great. So this is this is Winchester Dam um, on the North Umpqua River. It's seven miles from the confluence with the with the main stem. 
Uh, it is one of the state's highest priorities for uh, correction of, of fish passage problems uh, because it feeds passage uh, of migratory fish to 160 miles of high quality habitat. Uh, you'd be hard pressed to find a dam that impedes passage to more miles of high quality habitat um, in the state that is not slated for a removal. Uh, this dam dates back to 1890s, as you can see. It is a, it is a little bit of this and a little bit of that. It's a, it's a crib dam that originally was, was uh, quite a bit smaller and didn't go all the way uh, quite to the north side. Um, there wasn't a fish ladder when it was first built. It was built for uh, hydropower and water supply. Originally, uh, it was added to um, uh, uh, and increased in its height uh, in the early 20th century um, and uh, is now a, a, a concrete, um, timber, and steel um, construction uh, that is about uh, 16 or 17 feet tall. Um, it was um, largely uh, destroyed in an economic sense as a power generator by the 64 flood. Um, Pacific Corps or Pacific Corps predecessor at that time removed uh, the, um, its interest there and gave the dam uh, up for free to the Winchester Water Control District, which is a district that was formed specially in the late 60s to take possession of the dam. Again, they got it for free because the, land, the dam was no longer uh, economical to run as a hydropower dam. So it doesn't, hasn't produced hydropower for many years. There was an effort in the 80s to put hydropower back on the dam. Uh, this was because the state condemned the dam uh, uh, for being unsafe. Uh, the dam has a number of issues that uh, affect public safety, its structural integrity, um, and also cause harm to fish. And I'll go into that in my presentation. But in the 80s, um, the state condemned the dam in order to be torn down uh, and rebuilt or just simply torn down. Uh, that was the subject of a what's called a contested case. It was, so the district pushed back on that. Again, as the district form, especially to own the dam. Uh, for recreational purposes, uh, primarily water skiing, as far as I can tell, on the lake, uh, no longer serves any hydropower or water supply function. Actually, the city of Roseburg's water intake is downstream. But um, the effort to put hydropower back on the dam in the 80s failed, in, uh, in large part to efforts of, of, of folks at steam boaters and other, a lot other local uh, uh, fishermen and conservationists. Um, and that meant the, the funds were not there to rebuild the dam as was intended um, through the hydropower push was that the hydropower would somehow fund the rebuilding of the dam, even though in years past, Pacific Corps, presumably an expert on maintaining dams uh, economically, had decided it wasn't economical to maintain the dam to, um, to run hydropower. So that effort failed in the 80s. And indeed, the effort to condemn the dam even failed. The pushback was so strong from the owners that they were able to uh, achieve a settlement uh, a new dam safety order that required the dam to be inspected on a regular schedule approved by the state by an engineer hired by the, hired by the district. Uh, and I have found no, no evidence in the files that that, uh, that dam safety order has ever been uh, complied with uh, by the district. So since the 80s, um, the story of this dam has been uh, not just a story on dam safety, but a story on, on, on uh, fish, uh, fish health and fish passage. Uh, and water quality, all these things. Uh, it has been a, a, a place where somehow uh, laws don't apply and uh, the dam has persisted uh, despite its it, it incredible uh, decrepit and aged uh, condition and, and the numerous problems that, that it has. So um, with that, I'll just go to one of the, um, the first and most visible problems with the dam. Uh, one of the problems that people are really focused on, again, this is just one of the many problems of the dam, but I'm just focusing on the fish ladder because that's actually, we, we, when we first got interested in this dam, people were, were complaining to us about the fish ladder, the despair in the fish ladder. This is a picture of the fish ladder, all right? Um, as you can see right in the middle of the photograph, there's some nice rebar sticking up right in the middle of the fish ladder. This is where fish jump. There's also a lot of white water in the ladder. This is where water is gushing through the crib dam. There's an 1890s crib dam there. It's filled with, with river rock and otherwise it's made of timbers. I'll be showing pictures of this later. Um, water gushes through there. Fish are attracted against uh, that 
false attraction flow. It's what's called a false attraction flow. And they jump against it and injure themselves and they may end up killing themselves or, or, or at, the, at the minimum reducing their ability to reproduce when they get on the spawning grounds that they're, that they're trying to get to uh, from, this, from this, um, this, this fish passage structure. Um, again, fish in the North Umpqua, to get to the vast majority of the North Umpqua's high quality habitat, 160 miles of it, they have to go through this. Um, again, this is not part of the, the design, but this has been almost a perpetual feature in the dam that there's this false attraction flow that leads fish to a dead end in the fish ladder and causes them to jump above rebar spikes that have not been repaired for years. So the next thing I have is just a, a video um, that I took uh, last year in March showing uh, fish jumping repeatedly at the false attraction flows outside the ladder in the dam. This is the most visible place in the dam where you can see the false attraction flows. There's false attraction flows throughout the dam. You saw fish jump there. There's about 16 fish that'll be jumping in this video against that false attraction flow near the rebar spikes. There's another four fish that you'll see, you can see. It's harder to see the fish jumping against the false attraction flows in the rest of the dam. Uh, but they're there. And also, uh, by midway through this video, you'll also see three fish falling over the back of the dam. So that's another concern with the fish ladder and the fish passage of the dam, that when fish come, to the, come up the ladder, they're exhausted by these dead ends, they're exhausted by jumping at false attraction. They get to the top of the dam and they fall back over. And unfortunately, as you can see from the spume of, of, uh, of water um, jumping up, um, on the north side here, that there's a there's a very shallow ledge, so it's a it's a place that um, can injure adult fish that come back over. Whether or not the fish mean to go over it or not, obviously steel to go back down the river, um, and we want them to be able to go back down the river and come back up in as, as good a condition as they can, because that's there's another fish. Um, and um, of course, juveniles that go over this side of the dam are gonna be especially uh, harmed by uh, falling on shallow rock. There's another fish jumping. Um, so um, this is a main issue. Now, again, one of the things I wanna point out about this fish ladder too, it's placement is very bad for fish attraction. You can see here at the lower corner, that's supposed to be according to ODFW, the winter entrance, the high flow entrance. You won't see it in this four minute video, you won't see a single fish jump into that low flow entrance. You can see fish jump over and over and over again at the false attraction flows in the face of the ladder. When fish approach this dam, they come at the south end of this dam, which is hundreds of feet wide, and they have to, they have to swim across hundreds of feet of false attraction flow past exposed rebar, eroded concrete of the dam, at the face of the dam, to find their way to the fish ladder. And then they get in the fish ladder, and the fish, had, fish ladder has uh, flows into the, into the dead end here at the, at the bottom corner, which I'll be showing you some detail of later. Um, so the fish ladder is a major problem. I mean, obviously its structure is a problem as well. I mean, it has, um, it has a bunch of, of um, um, like I said, false attraction, injury, hot spots. Um, it has, um, you know, the attraction flows are poor. Um, it had, you know, the, the flow, just the basic flow, even without the false attraction to the crib, the flow over the dam makes finding the, the ladder's entrances problematic. There's right angle turns. The ODFW's ability to control flows is limited. Um, they don't have a substantive system for controlling flows. As we found out, one of the first things we tried to do as a coalition was offer via ODFW to the district to have an engineer paid for by our coalition go in there and create a substantive system for maximizing the efficiency of the ladder across flows in the river. Um, that offer was rejected uh, by the district uh, via ODFW. Uh, but that was one of the first things we did as a coalition to try to address the issues of the dam and we were buffed by, by the district. Um, so I'm gonna go to the next slide here. Um, this is just a close up of a fish striking um, the road of concrete and um, and rebar spikes as it's jumping against the false traction flows. Those four guys should be coming up in just a minute. There he goes. Um, so these problems have persisted in the ladder for years. I mean, the coalition has raised this issue with ODFW, raised this issue with, with, with NOAA. 
these are these are issues that we've been trying uh, to resolve. Uh, ODFW has sent uh, two letters since we started pushing. They sent a letter in 2019 to the district. They sent a letter in 2020 to the district asking for repairs to the ladder. Um, the, la the 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 the, the uh, district has done um, uh, inadequate and temporary repairs that have fallen off uh, to cover the rebar. They put um, conveyor belt material treated with flame retardant that apparently was salvaged from one of the one of the district uh, board members uh, concrete yards or whatever um, that keeps on falling off uh, and the rebar is exposed so right now fish migrating through this dam uh, are trying to get uh, into a ladder uh, that has um, rebar spikes at the most popular place for fish jumping this is actually a picture from 2006 that I found on the web just showing that the false attraction in the ladder um, the rebar spikes in the ladder, and obviously the ladder's poor design. I mean, you see the right angle turns. I mean, it's just a, it's a terrible, a terrible place for fish and, and, and tires them out uh, when they should have, at an absolute minimum, a modern ladder that's not full of leaks and spikes and uh, sharp corners. Um, myself and others have witnessed fish actually trying to jump straight up out of these, um, these sections of, of the ladder. Uh, this is a sign of a poorly designed ladder. The fish should just shoot through. They shouldn't be you know, jumping up in frustration because they can't find their way, the way out. This is something you can see in the ladder uh, when you go back after the pandemic, hopefully. Uh, it's something that's easily observed in the ladder to spend time there. Um, this is what the ladder looks like deep water. Okay, so this is where fish, remember the fish were jumping in this corner. That's what they're, they're jumping and falling against. You can see the eroded concrete. You can see the sharp edges everywhere. Um, if you have a sharp eye, you can see that they put in pressure treated wood. Pressure treated wood is not allowed to be placed as a piling. In essential salmonid habitat. This is essential salmonid habitat. This is a picture from 2009. The much of the crib dam, as far as we know, has been replaced by the owners with pressure treated wood. Pressure treated wood is also advised by the EPA and other authorities not to be anywhere where it comes into contact or indirect contact with water for a drinking supply. This is 50 feet upstream from the city of Roseburg's water supply. This is another shot of the pressure treated wood in the crib. You can see what the old crib from the 1890s looks like and what it's been replaced with, with pressure treated. Again, this is the area where the water is gushing through the dam uh, because the cobbles uh, in the crib dam, which is kind of like a railroad trestle with a, you know, with a slate on its side with a, with a kind of dance floor on one side that's this pressure treated wood. And then you, you fill it back in with, with, with rock and then once you seal everything up, the river comes in and just excavates out the rock. And I'll show you pictures of this. And then you just have gushers through the, through the, through the uh, crib face. There's 370 feet of this that fish have to navigate false attraction flows in the crib face before they even get to the entrances to the ladder. So there's a lot of injury going on here. Uh, there's a lot of false attraction. There's a lot of exhaustion. It's, it's costing uh, everybody who cares about uh, the fish in the river uh, every day. This is a 2013 photograph. So those ones from previously were 2009. This is what it looks like again uh, in this area where fish are attracted to, to jump. There's the there's a pressure treated wood, um, which is known to be toxic uh, to fish. Um, so now we'll go on to the next hot spot, which is um, the crib face. So this is a century old cobble filled wooden crib, which regularly produces holes across its 367 feet between the concrete abutments. So these, this is just a bunch of fish, false attraction flows and fish entrainment, entrainment uh, spots. So these false attraction and entrainment issues persist for years between dam repairs. Um, and we, we can see in the, in the record that even when they do dam repairs, they only, you know, the engineer says things like, well, we, we cut down the, the flow through the dam by 50%. So again, you still have false attraction flows even immediately after repair. Um, so flows through the through the through individual holes in the crib face actually exceed the flows for attraction into the fish ladder. So again, the entrance of the fish ladder, the flow coming out of the entrance of the fish ladder is smaller than many of the holes in the face of the dam. Um, an eroded reinforced concrete sill runs under the entire length of the crib dam, further subjecting fish to injury by exposed rebar and eroded concrete. This obvious source of injury has been left unrepaired for years. So here's a video uh, taken by a lamprey researcher showing what the flows of the crib face are like.
So fish are trying to swim in that. Steelhead are, are going to get into trouble uh, with that with that uh, with that kind of a structure. Again, it's 370 feet of uh, fish injuring structure here. This is a 1980s. Uh, scheme from a, the inspection of the dam. The dam has not been inspected since 1987. That's another issue. Uh, it hasn't been comprehensively inspected since 1987 by a professional engineer. This is just a diagram showing um, areas of leakage in the dam. There's a significant amount of leakage against the, the south abutment, but there's leakage all throughout the crib. Um, and this, um, this leakage, leakage is extensive. Again, here's another scheme showing leakage areas in the crib from um, inspection. This is a uh, more recent inspection showing areas where rock eroded out of the wood um, uh, crib um, and uh, you know deterioration associated with leakage through the crib. Again, false attraction um, flows. And again, you can see the nice um, uh, metal bolt ends um, that uh, protrude from the dam. Um, causing injury to fish when they jump. This is a picture showing kind of what the false attraction flow uh, looks like when you take away the uh, cover of the cascade over the top of the dam. This is um, at a time when the dam was um, so poorly kept up in the 90s uh, that um, water didn't run over the top of the dam on the south side. This is again from, from that period, which gives you an idea of what occurs when the dam is not repaired on a regular basis. This dam hasn't seen significant repair since 2013. This is the calculation of the flows, the false traction flows through the, the crib face. So this uh, basically says uh, when they had a flow of uh, uh, 1,051 CFS, they estimated that the leaks in the dam combined to 370 CFS. Um, again, this is when the fish ladder inches only flow like 47 or 43 CFS. And this is when we, there was a there was a, a bypass for hydropower, which, which brought in 346 CFS. So presumably that flow would proportionally be going through the uh, over the top and through the holes um, without that, that exit for uh, hydropower uh, since we don't have that any longer. Um, so again, we're talking about serious false attraction uh, bringing fish into areas with significant risk of injury and death. So this is what it looks like when a cross section of the crib, this is what happens. This, this lower figure shows the concrete cap, which is put over the, the, the predecessor crib. The concrete cap takes, creates a, a nice vortex here that excavates out the, uh, the cobble, creating uh, false attraction flow through the dam. Um, but also the excavation occurs very much against the seams of the crib. That's why it was such a problem at the ladder. There's a seam of concrete north abutment against the crib, the crib structure that creates a lot of water force right against that seam, which works out the, the cobble. And then you end up with that gusher, a false attraction, leading fish to jump over and over again against rebar in the fish ladder. This is what it looks like uh, in the crib um, when you don't repair the dam on a regular basis. This is from the 90s. Uh, but again, the dam has not been repaired since 2013. Uh, so there may be similar scenes inside the crib right now. And this is obviously a terrible place for fish to be tracked into. This is just showing you the rebar and eroded concrete in the sill at the base of the dam. Uh, you can see also the, the, the ends. So the dam is held, the, the crib dam at least is held to the, to the river by um, essentially rebar spikes uh, shot through at an angle into the crib face and bolted to the bedrock. Um, so that's why you see those bolt faces. That's what the, that's what's holding the crib dam in place. It's got a concrete sill down there, uh, full of eroded concrete. Again, there's a narrow bench of, uh, bedrock all along the north half of the riverbed, which were fish either falling against as their juveniles or adults out migrating or they're falling against as in-migrating adults, uh, jumping against false attraction flows. Again, if they're coming up the main stem, they're gonna come to the south abutment, and then they're gonna have to navigate all this to get to the ladder, and the ladder itself is totally inadequate. So here's just more showing seepage, sources of injury, rebar spikes, places the fish could be injured and die on the, on the, on the dam. 
All right, so let me see, going to the next issue, the roller gates. Okay, so the roller gates are how you um, repair this dam, or at least traditionally how they're repairing the dam uh, since I've been able to find records going back into the 80s. They'll, they'll pull up these roller gates, they'll let the full force of the river go through the roller gates. This will not only bring a whole bunch of sediment, wash a whole bunch of sediment out against um, uh, essential, into essential ham salmon habitat, which is again, not allowed, but it creates what's called a velocity barrier. So there's a total upstream migration stoppage because fish can't jump against this uh, uh, mi migration barrier. So according to published eyewitness account, the drawdown flushes silt. According to ODFW, the temporary drawdown, the reservoir pool uh, creates a total upstream fish passage barrier. So in, the, in recent repairs, until we started making a noise as a, as a, as a coalition, the repairs would drop the river for 12 days, 17 days at a time, and just stop, stop migration, adult migration of fish at the start of coho migration. This is a listed species protected under the federal law. But again, you're not allowed under state law even to stop migration of salmon without a waiver from ODFW. But again, one of the reasons that this dam has persisted in this way and these practices persist because the state's reluctance to enforce the law here. And that's one of the reasons why the coalition exists is to demand that the law be obeyed at the dam. Um, one other thing, just to go to the next point in the presentation, engineering reports, inspections consistently describe under dam currents and cavities producing visible persistent false attraction flows in this area of the roller gate. So not only the roller gate's an issue um, for stopping upstream migration when they try to repair the dam so they can access to the dam by drawing the reservoir down, but there's undercurrents underneath uh, the roller gates. Um, so again, these flows likely uh, exceed uh, traction flows into the ladder. So this is uh, what, it, what the philosophy barrier looks like. This is a photo I took in the, during the 2013 repair. Another picture of what the velocity barrier looks like. This is an ODFW picture of a fish jumping against the velocity barrier during a previous repair. Doesn't look fun. Um, this is a picture of the up, this is a video of the upwelling I took in 2017. Visible from the, to the naked eye from across the river. You can see the upwelling there on the other side of the, um, the white water. There's another picture of the upwelling. They made a repair attempt in 2018 that ended up polluting the river, uh, polluting the water supply for 37,000 people and killing a number of fish. Um, that repair was unsuccessful. There's a hole there now that they need to repair. Uh, but they did it by trying to pour concrete into, um, into the hole before isolating uh, it from uh, the river flow. Um, I mean, they drew things down, but they did a very mediocre job and, uh, and, did, and basically ignored um, guidance provided by uh, National Marine Fisher Service and ODFW, uh, and they ended up uh, polluting the water supply of 37,000 uh, people. Um, this is just a... Uh, uh, eyewitness account in the local paper of the silt gushing from the um, from the roller gates during the repairs. Again, these repairs in the past have occurred every approximately every three to five years, and they've just dumped silt on essential salmon and habitat. Um, usually during early September, during adult um, the very beginning of adult coho migration in stream. Um, so the hotspot number four for for both safety and uh, and fish is that the dam south south abutment lies partially on sediment and debris. It's not sealed to bedrock. So that means it's perpetually undermined by flowing water. At times, the water has excavated out holes large enough for human divers to explore. So obviously there's there's public major public safety issues related to the south abutment, um, but it, it generates uh, uh, false attraction flows for fish, which generally approach um, in the main stem of the river here in the south abutment, and they have to get past all these false directions to get themselves to the ladder. Um, this is just a 80s sketch of some of the erosion of the south abutment. Um, this is in the area of the old uh, hydropower facility that's no longer there. Uh, this is just another uh, area uh, um, sketch um, showing what we what what shows up in like all the inspections that there's whirlpools here, that there's sea poles here that there's upwelling on the other side. This is bad for fish and it's uh, also dangerous to have from a public safety uh, perspective. This is one of the areas of the dam that's most likely to fail. 
Um, I just wanted to uh, quote a memo to Governor Atia from the 80s. This is during the push to get the dam condemned. Uh, the hazard potential for the structure is primarily uh, the potential for loss of lives of people downstream. Other uh, you know, uh, concerns include damage to the water intake um, and to the hybrid bridges. So um, this is something that people have known about for, for a long time. Um, the, the, the state safety folks, they've been a focus of, of our uh, push. We, we keep demanding that they apply the law here. Uh, we finally got them to um, essentially order the district to finally have an emergency action plan that complies with law. So literally they don't have an emergency action plan that allows them to notify uh, authorities appropriately and react uh, to help first responders uh, save people downstream and protect property downstream because uh, they couldn't be bothered to respond to the water resources department asking them in writing every year for over a decade to update their emergency action plan, which dates to 1987, which is also the last time this dam was inspected uh, comprehensively by a professional for, for safety. And at that time in 87, when the engineer inspected, they said the dam it was well past its useful life and should be inspected every year, which has not occurred. So this is just a picture of um, the, um, one of the other, other issues of the dam, water quality. So one of the things they don't do with the dam but the dam owners do not like to get permits for their repairs. So we have not found any record of permitting for repairs of this dam going back into the 90s. Um, we haven't found even records of professional engineers uh, being involved in the planning of repairs. Uh, they did have a professional engineer uh, observing uh, their uh, repairs, but they never had a design or, a, or an engineering assessment since the 90s to uh, tell them how to best repair the dam and how to do it in a way that uh, reduces harm to fish and water quality. So this is their repair attempt in 2018 as seen on Oregon Explorer. You can see the plume of sediment going downstream from the south abutment. Uh, here they built a crib dam, I'm sorry, not a crib dam, a coffer dam by dumping uh, gravel into the river uh, that was filthy and uh, causing a whole bunch of dirt to go uh, and set them to go downstream. And then they dumped green concrete in the river, which flowed downstream and, uh, and passed the city water intake and also the uh, uh, um, uh, caused turbidity at the water intake for the Umpqua Basin Water Authority. Um, so that's a major issue. The public drinking supplies impacts, we're working to make sure that they are permitted for repairs going forward. So not only would they protect fish and then not do things like cause uh, total upstream migration stoppage uh, and cause uh, pollution spills that kill fish and repair using toxic material materials toxic to fish, um, but that they that they actually um, have uh, enforceable uh, permits um, that tell them how to make repairs in a way that that avoids all those impacts. And again, they have been instructed. They were instructed by letter from the Water Department in 19, 2019 uh, that the dam was in poor condition and needed uh, repair of known safety issues soon. Those repairs have yet to occur. Uh, our inspection was called for during that same letter. That inspection has yet to occur, uh, but a comprehensive structural inspection of the dam. Uh, they have produced nothing in writing for the safety officials to see since 2019, indicating what their plans are for repair of the dam. As I mentioned, ODFW sent them a letter in 2019 asking for repair of the fish ladder. They sent them another one in 2020 asking for repair of the fish ladder. Those repairs have not occurred. Um, and, uh, and so all this comes to where, where you know, uh, we, we, we have um, been dealing with what we believe to be scoff laws and people who just will not um, make a good faith effort to obey the law. They just find ways to skirt it. So uh, as a last resort, we have brought suit this fall uh, in November uh, for violations of the Endangered Species Act, uh, ongoing harm to coho, which are listed. Uh, but obviously the harm is occurring across uh, all the species that try to get, uh, get across this dam, including lamprey, uh, which are decimated every time they draw the dam down for repairs. There's a lot of uh, young lamprey that live in the sediments above the dam and are dewatered and die. Um, uh, and then there's a the water quality impacts. And then of course there's the public safety impacts. There's, there's 
if you have um, a dam that's not in good condition, is it more likely to fail? Um, and when it fails, do you have um, the systems in place? Um, and do you have, are you um, are undertaking those practices required by state law to make sure that you're prepared for um, for uh, problems if they occur? And, and uh, our belief is that that's not the case here, um, that uh, we have a situation where the dam owners are not interested in, in uh, maintaining this dam or, or at least not interested in paying the cost for maintaining the dam and, and maintaining regulation um, uh, um, compliance. Um, so um, it, it remains to be seen where this will end up. Obviously, um, one of the easiest paths would be given um, uh, the way things are set up in the state of Oregon, if you have a high priority fish passage barrier and you agree voluntarily to remove the, the dam, state, federal, and private entities are set up to fund that entirely at no cost to the dam owner. So we did before, before engaging litigation, uh, the whole coalition did write to the dam owner saying, if you are interested in removing this dam, we will pledge to raise the money uh, to, to remove that dam uh, at little to no cost uh, to you to support what actually was a water watch initially made that offer in February and then the co whole coalition made that offer uh, in, in April. Uh, that was rejected um, by, by the district. Um, but, but obviously they could uh, do a significant rebuild on this dam Judging from the last time they were asked to do a significant rebuild where they tried to get hydropower, they don't have the finances to pay the tens of millions of dollars it would cost to do a significant rebuild of the dam. But clearly this structure is years past its, its useful life. Uh, it's dangerous. Uh, it's poorly maintained as it is. And uh, it's a hazard to fish and water quality and public safety. So um, with that, I'll just uh, conclude my, my presentation. Um, Jim? Uh, Great work. Bob Schultz here. Can you hear me? Thank you, Jim. I'm Bob. Can you wait just a second? I just wanted to say thank you, Jim. Yeah. Great work. Um, and uh, yeah, we have a couple of questions that came in, but Bob, if, if you've got a question, go ahead and kick us off here. Why don't you? Yes, sir. I'll follow in your uh, question is by complimenting Jim on putting such a, a complicated and uh, diverse and uh, passed over necessity. I mean, the contribution thing, uh, uh, I've been, uh, my career's in public service uh, in the city of Los Angeles Fire Department uh, for near 30 years. And we've been up here 12 years. I'm a life member of Steamboat. I felt uh, uh, in favor of anything that would protect, uh, first of all, people. Uh, people eat fish, uh, the whole uh, sequence of who thinks in this process. And what occurs to me is uh, where is the Army Corps of Engineers step in on this? That's one part of it. And it seems that there have been precedents already. And we don't have to, it seems to me, we don't have to take off adopting uh, a code. Uh, and they should adopt a, a code or use somebody else's code rather than kick off a brand new court case. Uh, yes, it's, uh, it, you guys have put in a lot of work on this, but kick off a new court case. It's like uh, not adopting uh, uh, the International Association of Building Officials and every town uh, down to two or three people, whatever they call a town uh, that has to go out and write their own codes. You adopt this stuff by reference and these safety issues uh, I was in the fire service in 1963 when the Bard, uh, when the Baldwin Hills uh, earthen dam concrete cover failed. And uh, yeah, we lost eight people. We didn't lose any firefighters. We were in there with the first Bell helicopters to pull people off roofs. So, you know, it occurs to me that uh, somehow this omnibus uh, in, uh, I'm thinking Corps of Engineers, I'm thinking, uh, coalition omnibus uh, study, I, it seems to me that this, you folks have carried the ball uh, beyond belief. And uh, with the premise, uh, it seems the prim primary premise is river protection. Uh, upstream, we got a wild, a wild and scenic river portion. Uh, Frank and Jeannie Moores, uh, uh, we know them 
We know them well. When we moved up here, I've driven Frank and Jeannie in the Veterans Day Parade. I don't want to carry on and take up any more time, but where, where is this coalition? Are you going to head uh, uh, the, I mean, you've got attorneys here that uh, may be hungry for taking this. That only funding it, they're going to walk away from it. Yeah. Uh, so, Bob, there was a lot in there. I, I appreciate the question and, and your yeah. comments. So, our court does does have a role here, and um, but it's a kind of an alphabet soup of of authority. So, DEQ, Department of Water Quality, Department of State Lands, ODFW. Um, aren't so when there was a spill in 2018. Um, there was an initial investigation by Army Corps, and they declined um, to pursue uh, enforcement action. DEQ did an investigation and did take enforcement action. So the, the contractor for the repair, Basco Logging, um, which happens to be the contractor who's always been the contractor for repair since the 90s, and was the pr longtime president, still board member of the district, Juan Ragwin. Um, so they were fined fifty thousand dollars by, um, or more, a little bit more than fifty thousand dollars by DEQ. And so the Army Corps is following this issue, and Army Corps has a role. Like so, for example, you could say because they're going to do a repair in the fall. At least they're telling people now they're going to do a repair, though they literally have not provided a single shred of written design work or anything to ODFW or WRD. Uh, because I do public records requests to them constantly um, saying this is what we're going to do or this is what we found or this is what we need to repair. Um, they, but they could right now, for example, be submitting a permit uh, or what's called a removal fill permit to, to Army Corps and Department of Lands, but they're, but they're not. So what, what, one thing that has been really frustrating about this process is that whether or not you're coming with a with a carrot saying, I'm going to give, we're going to provide $10,000 to do a study on this, this fish ladder, which, which will provide an owner's manual for you to run it more efficiently for fish. And ODFW says, this is great. Why don't we do this? Because this is something that would make things better for fish. And the owners say, no, we go, we go in with a carrot and, or we say, we'll take the dam out for you for a little no cost to you at all. Like literally we can go get money right now and take this dam out. They say, no. But we, now we're, we are litigating, we're, 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 we have chosen the paths that we think are gonna be most effective, um, like litigating in the ESA, to come to resolution. But these things, even with a stick, it takes time. It's not, it's not something that, that happens um, quickly, unfortunately. I'm gonna go ahead and jump in with our next question real quick here, and maybe you can just rattle this one off, Jim. What are the five big hurdles to face to have the dam removed? Well, <clears throat> I mean, you, you need to have an agreement to remove the dam. I mean, I, get, I guess at the end of the day, you could get a court order to remove the dam, right? But that, um, that would put the whole burden of the uh, removal costs onto the district, which is some 200 landowners. So that's less than ideal. I mean, obviously, they're, they, they've benefited from this dam for decades and they have not obeyed regulation for decades. But, um, the, the, you know, at the end of the day, what we, we're not interested in punishment here. We're interested in solving the problem for fish, right? So the, the easiest thing to do would be to, to, to get a settlement um, with the district and agree with the district, whereby we can go out and we can raise the 10 million or whatever it takes to remove the dam, um, and that would be uh, ideal. Um, th there, but but at the, but at the end of the day, I mean, there is opportunity. There's, a, there's opportunity, but it, it's rebuild. just a matter of changing minds or people realizing liability. I think I think one of the things that the people in the district are learning is that the laws do apply to them, which is which is something that hadn't occurred until this coalition was created. Excuse me, Jim. You got uh, Pete uh, holding his hand up here. Uh, he I do. I do. I have, <clears throat> excuse me. I have a couple questions. Um, and 
uh, so you, you're talking about what ten million dollars to remove the dam? That's just a ballpark. Uh, we haven't had an, we haven't had an engineer in there to look at the 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 total cost. But, but judge, you know, we we were part of the group that took out a very similar dam in the Rogue. It was called Gold Ray, uh, and that was that was a little less than ten million bucks, if I remember correctly. Well, uh, have you got an estimate on putting in a, a usable fish ladder? Because that that fish ladder looks like crap. I mean, I've spent some time on fish ladders, and a good fish ladder works really well. Yeah, we, we don't have an estimate on the fish ladder. My assumption is be that, that putting in a fish ladder would cost more than removing the dam. But but you've got to recognize that that there's more than just the fish ladder issue, right? Like if you put in a perfect fish ladder there, you still have a 367 feet of, of false attraction flow and fish injury. And um, you think it would cost more than $10 million to put in a fish ladder? Pete, I just went through a presentation showing you. I know, I know, and I was and I was watching it. But dam, it, it could cost more than 10 million bucks to put in a fish ladder. We have a 130 year old dam that is that that. We, it could fall down before we get a settlement on it. So you could slap a fish ladder on the dam, but you still need to solve the problem of the whole dam, which is it's a public safety hazard, it's a water quality hazard, and it's a fish hazard. Okay, so I, I understand that, but I still want to see fish moving freely through there. Um, is there a homeowner association for the people who have the, um, you know, who are taking care of this or having a part in you know, enjoying yes. this. It's called the Winchester Water Control District. It's a district that was created to own the dam in the late 60s to take it over from Pacific Corps. And again, I, I just got to go back to my original point. If you put a brand new ladder on this dam, you still have the problem that the dam is on the edge of falling down. So what are you going to do about the dam? The dam itself kills oh. fish. Oh, no, trust me. I hate that dam. <laughs> but, but... But at the same time, that uh, our, the uh, ladder that's there right now is pathetic. Oh, I agree. Yeah. And, and we, we, th that's one of the reasons why the first thing we did was like, okay, look, this is probably going to be a long debate about this dam, what, you know, and talking to people about what to do. So let's get in there and do the, the first thing we can think of that'll, that'll improve the situation for fish. Get an owner's manual based on an engineer's assessment for how to run that ladder. And so one of the first things we did was we sent a doc request to OD ODFW saying, give us your, your manual for how to operate this ladder. And they gave us four pieces of paper that looked like they'd been drawn on the back of a napkin. And, and we said, guys, you don't have a substantive system for, for running this, this ladder. And they said, we don't. I said, well, we, we have you know, 10,000 bucks and an estimate from an engineer to go in there and do that. And they said, okay, well, we'll go get permission from the district. And the district said, no way, you're gonna, we're gonna let you in there. Uh, in wow. fact, the district wrote us a letter saying that it was uh, subversive uh, for us to suggest that we wanted to get in there and repair the ladder. So one of the hurdles for just replacing the ladder too is you gotta get the, the permission from the owners to, to do anything. But again, I, I would, you always have to do a cost benefit analysis when you're using public money. And I would say that in my experience, it'd be very unlikely that just replacing that ladder would, would, would pass that because you'd have to replace the whole dam to, to end harm to fish. Okay. Well, you don't have a picture either. Jim, there, here's another question that came in and through the chat. Um, who's responsible for enforcing these regulations and aren't they going to do it? So if you could just name out some of those folks and um, how that process has gone so far. That works, but I don't know if it'll well, the whole thing. Um, for fish passage, it's ODFW um, uh, on the state level. And then um, for water quality, it's DEQ. Uh, for permitting, it's DEQ, DSL, Army Corps, ODFW, National Marine Fishery Service. For example, National Marine Fishery Service has regulatory authority over COHO. Um, one of the things, you know, why the district may be, you know, trying to avoid any of these processes is because entrance into any of these processes will, will trigger a number of other processes. So, for example, if you go in to get a permit through the Department of State Lands because you want to protect, you know, you want to do it right and protect the water quality and, the, you know, the essential salmon habitat, well, you might trigger, arguably, 
uh, a fish pass review under ODFW. And that ladder is not going to pass a fish pass review because it's a piece of junk. Um, so they're not going to be able to go through that. And then it could trigger, um, you know, uh, a permit from the Army Corps. And that's a federal action. So then National Marine Fishery Service has to do a consultation of the Endangered Species Act. So um, that, again, it would be something that the district would probably want uh, to avoid. So that's one of the reasons why, you know, there's this tension here where they're kind of playing chicken with all these regulations and trying to see if they can find their way through. And that's what they've done, they've done in the past where they literally just have ignored, um, you know, orders from uh, the safety officials. I want to make clear though, this dam is, it's safety uh, regulation is under the Oregon Water Resources Department, which is uh, which is responsible for the dam safety for dams that are not federally regulated. That means dams that don't have hydropower. Dams that do have hydropower have, you know, Federal Energy Regulatory Commission uh, has authority over them. Um, but um, on the state level, if you have a dam that, that isn't otherwise regulated by the feds, it's regulated by the state. And that's, th those people are incredibly underfunded. There's a gazillion dams. The state does consider this to be a high hazard dam, which is just an indication that it doesn't mean it is going to fail, but if it does fail, the consequences will be bad. And so um, it, is, it is one of the, one of the dams of the state that, that is considered high hazard is, is regulated by the state. Jim, along those lines, uh, one of the questions that came in um, was, it was mentioned in the news review about high risk of property damage and debris downstream um, from the dam if it were to failure. Um, I know we have one folks, one one person at least on the line that um, lives downstream. Can you can you share some of the impacts that might have if if it were to fail? Well, that is something that hasn't been studied since the '80s. So in the in the '80s, they created uh, an emergency action plan um, to be part of the hydropower um, build that never occurred, but that document uh, is the one that has sat around um, since then. And it did have um, uh, an engineer um, generating what's called an inundation map. So that what they did is they said, okay, if the river flow is at this amount, when the dam fails, this is what's gonna happen. So the Roseburg Rod and Gun Club, the, there's, a, there's a trailer park just downstream, there's, Amica Park just downstream. I, I, I don't recall off the top of my head the, the uh, full extent of the inundation map, um, but that, the, the, off the top of my head, those are some of the areas that are included. And so, um, and obviously the two um, bridges, but um, that was an inundation map generated using one specific flow level. And so, uh, which was kind of like a early summer flow level. So, um, you know, if the dam were to fail in a different flow level, it would be in a, di a different uh, kind of inundation map. I'm not an engineer, but what, one of the things that our coalition has succeeded in doing is we got the state, we just kind of hounded the state and said, why can you let these folks, you know, <laughs> have a high hazard dam and not comply with state law for decades? And so they sent, you know, letters um, asking for them to come up with a new emergency action plan so that the first responders would have a system to respond to this dam in case it fails. Um, that, that emergency action plan is not gonna have an inundation map with contemporary techniques, engineering techniques used to generate it until October of this year. So we're gonna have to wait till then to know when an engineer hired by the district uh, has come up with a map showing what the areas of, of damage are, are gonna be. But, my understanding is the likeliest situation for the failure of the dam is that the south abutment, like I said, is not really, it's sitting on cobble, right? So, or, or partly on cobble. So that it could move and that could affect the seam at the crib concrete junction, right? And that could cause the crib to kind of unzip. There's another failure point, which is those rebar spikes that are holding the, the crib to the, to the, riverbed, those were a particular interest in the 80s. Those haven't been tested since the 80s. Um, so that's one of the things that the state wants them to test is those rebar, there's, there's hun like, I guess, hundreds of rebar spikes in there. And some of them are obviously rusted and, and aren't holding any weight. Those could 
those could unzip and you could get kind of a, an opening of the, of the crib. But, but because they do so little repair to the crib, there's so many false attraction flows that the ironic thing is, is what's good for public safety there is, is for the river to scour out those holes. So there's actually less tension against those rods. So all these fish are jumping into the false attraction flow, but the, actually the, the tension against the crib is being reduced by having that flow go through the, through the face as opposed to over the top. So um, my understanding is those, those rods are, are of stimming concern, but people are not that worried that the crib is gonna fail just because it's so full of holes and so there's less tension. But the south abutment, because it's, it's being excavated by the river perpetually, that's an area that they're, they're concerned about. And that's right up against the city's water intake too. So, um, that should be an area of concern for the city of Roseburg. Awesome. Jim, may I interject here? Oh. Just short. I'm, I'm not going to belabor it uh, as I probably did on the first thought of the box here. And I'm not trying to grandstand, but what does this all distill down to? You folks have gone, uh, you've broken everything uh, in your mind, uh, I should say body, uh, to assemble these facts and put this thing on the track. How would it best distill into not maybe the fish, the fish or an ancillary issue here. It's public safety and it's the core of engineers. And if there is that uh, public safety and they, the feds, especially now with the administration, uh, somebody busy and whether uh, uh, your uh, organization and your uh, your affiliates can get together in an omnibus and take this to the feds. Uh, the uh, the local authorities have repeatedly, as you pointed out, they walked away from it. Condemnation orders, this, that, and other thing. Uh, who's going to carry the banner on this to get this done without going through another 10, 15 years? I'm not going to live that long, but I sure as hell don't want to see my compatriots uh, in the local uh, uh, fire police rescue business uh, uh, trying to get a, a, uh, an inflatable in there and pull some uh, people out of the water, you know. Well, we don't have to do that. Uh, I'll just, I'll, I'll just, so again, we, Army Corps, Army Corps did send a letter saying they likely need a permit next time because the last time they polluted the river when they didn't get permits when they did the repair in 2018. But, but We've appealed to Army Corps to, to do more here and to require uh, uh, permitting. Um, it, it's, it's not clear to me and that, that the Army Corps um, is willing to do as you suggest here and, and come in here and, and drive the issue to a, to a head. So, um, so we've, we've um, we, we continue to communicate with Army Corps, but again, because it's a state safety issue, because it's not a federal regulated dam, um, we're really just appealing to the state, but even the state actors are, are reluctant. And I gotta say, you know, I mean, you look at the correspondence between, you know, the district and and these, you know, whether it's the, the local, you know, Douglas County safety person or um, the, the state safety person or ODFW, you know, when they're talking about repairs of the dam, I look on these emails and it's like, who's on the emails? There's not, there's no engineer on the emails. It's like the district board and their attorney. It's like, this is, they're, they're very, they're, I think, look, I mean, we, they had a $50,000 fine for pouring green concrete into the river. And they went to D, the DQ and they said, you don't have authority to regulate against us for polluting the river 50 feet upstream from the, from the city of Roseburg. And they're still arguing that now. There's four members of the coalition that have joined in with Crag Law Center representing Native Fish, Umpqua Basin Water Association, uh, Umpqua Basin, I'm uh, sorry, Umpqua Watersheds, um, uh, Steamboaters and Oregon Wild were in there advocating for the river fish. But like the district is very much on this path of we're gonna fight every last thing, we're gonna drag our feet every last thing. So I, I would just urge folks not to underestimate how long it takes to get to a resolution over, over these issues because the state is often reluctant to enforce laws in the books against powerful, politically well-connected people. And that's what we have here. And so we just have to keep on raising this issue in public 
um, so, until, until we I'm reach gonna, a solution. I'm going to kind of wrap this up here just because we are, we're an hour in, we are only planning on 45 minutes. It's, it's been a great conversation now, and it's exciting to see so much interest in it. I want, I want to let everyone know we have recorded all the questions from the chat box and other questions. Um, I'm going to do some follow up on those and get back to you. I understand who asked those questions and I'll share those with everyone. Um, one thing that Jim and I kind of wanted to share with everyone is we want to make sure that folks stay connected on this issue. Um, reach out to myself or Jim with any further questions, but also help share this information throughout the communities that you live in or the local community of Roseburg um, on some of these issues with the dam. Native Fish Society will be posting this presentation to our website, so you can feel free. I'll send a link out to everyone that's on the call today to share that with uh, anyone that might be interested in learning more. But again, we can't thank you enough for joining us today and sharing this education with everyone else within the community. Um, Jim, did you have any last call to actions real quick? Uh, no, I, I just want to say thanks, Native Fish and everybody, and appreciate all the the, the questions. Uh, yeah, please just, uh, I would say, you know, contact your, your local electeds, contact your state representative, ask them uh, to uh, to ensure that, that the law is enforced at Winchester Dam, whether it's water quality, uh, protections for fish and wildlife, protections for uh, people and property. All those things are at stake with this dam. Uh, and, and, and the reason is because keeping a dam is very expensive. And one of the things I, I should just mention is this district um, runs on a budget, uh, it's typical outlay in a, on, a, on a year is around $12,000 a year, 11,000 is for the board's insurance, 1,000 for miscellaneous fees. And then uh, it collects you know, around uh, $35,000 a year from its, from its members. So that's around 200 bucks uh, from every landowner. So they've been, they've been running this dam very cheap. And that's the, one of the reasons why this dam is still there is because um, they've been able to get away with um, not obeying regulations and they've been able to run it on the cheap and that the cost is coming out of the river and, and the risk is going on to uh, those downstream. So um, I, I would just, I would just urge folks to contact their elected uh, representatives, ask them to ensure that ODFW, WRD, DQ, DSL, all these state agencies that have authority here enforce the law for the protection of fish, uh, wildlife, water quality, and, and people and property. Awesome. Well, thank you, Jim. Um, thank you. So I just want to leave us today with uh, a thank you to Jim. I also want to give a shout out to Jennifer Fairbrother, our uh, conservation director for running the Zoom account for us today and helping out with some things. Um, next week, we're actually going to be doing another Lunch and Learn. It's going to be on utilizing drones to protect endangered species. Um, it's going to be with uh, drone pilot Nick Wagner, and he's going to share about utilizing these drones to advance the efforts to reform steep slope logging in Oregon's coastal range. So if that's something that interests you, keep your eyes plugged in for that. Um, we'll be announcing it later this week. Um, but thank you all and thank you, Jim. Stay tuned. Great job, Jim and Kurt. Great job. Thanks, Tim. Have a good day, everyone.